Uh, it is now my pleasure uh, to introduce our, our guest leader today, Ohio Supreme Court Justice Melody Stewart. Uh, Justice Stewart was elected in 2018 as the 161st Justice to serve on the Supreme Court of Ohio. Prior to joining the Supreme Court, Justice Stewart served as the 8th District Court of Appeals uh, for 12 years and was the court's administrative judge in 2013. Um, I will let the justice uh, summarize her extensive educational and professional background in a few minutes here, but I would like to highlight her service on many boards and committees, uh, including uh, her service to the Ohio Criminal Justice Recodification Committee, the Ohio Supreme Court's Judicial College Board. Uh, she also served as the chair of the Ohio Capital Case Attorney Fee Council, and she served as a commissioner and chair of the Board of Planning and Zoning Committees for uh, the city of Euclid. Um, of historical note, and I think this is important to mention, is Justice Stewart uh, is the first African-American woman elected to the Ohio Supreme Court. And it's truly our indeed uh, pleasure to have her here with us today. Um, I'd like to start off our interview by asking uh, the judge to introduce uh, herself and to give us an overview of her education and history and a glimpse of the responsibilities of Ohio Supreme Court justice, which many of us don't know a lot about. Thank you. Thank you for having me and, and for all the students. Hello on this bright, sunshiny day in, in Northeast Ohio. Um, you, you heard basically at least the last couple of careers I've had in the law, um, being elected to the Supreme Court and then prior to that to the Court of Appeals. But my work as a lawyer before that was a mixture of, of largely two things, law practice, but more so of law, legal academia. So prior to becoming a judge, I was a law professor and uh, an assistant dean. And I had the pleasure of working for three of the nine Ohio law schools, Cleveland Marshall University, Toledo, and Case Western Reserve School of Law. Um, and so I started off practicing law, as I think most people who go to law school tend to do, or think they need to do, which is practice law. And that certainly is not true. And I learned that later on in life, particular, particularly when I became an admissions student, and people were interested in, in going to law school and not sure if they wanted to practice law. And I said, you don't have to practice law. Law is a very uh, versatile degree, and there are a lot of things you can do with it, as my career has, has evidenced. Um, so I'll, I'll take you just a brief background history about myself. I was born and raised in, in Cleveland uh, and spent my formative years in, in the Cleveland public and Cleveland Catholic schools, um, went to Goldman High School in Cleveland Heights. And interestingly enough, that's probably where the seed was planted for me to eventually run for office. Um, I was a junior in high school when the then she was called the, the Dean of Girls back in my day, the, you know, the Ursula nuns at a Catholic school, approached me and, and, and thought that I should run for student council vice president. And so I remember thinking, are you kidding me? I'm not running for anything except first base on our softball team or down the court to get the ball to do a layup or to the bus to get home for that day. Just never thought about running for anything. I um, took that information home to my mother and um, told her what the sister of the nun had said to me. And my mother asked her if I was going to do it. And I said, I don't know. Let me give it some thought. And um, I thought about it the next morning. And she said, you're going to do it? And I said, nah, I don't think so. And she looked disappointed. And, and she said, why? And I said, because I think I'm going to run for president instead. <laughs> and so I did. And I ironically became Beaumont's first student council, uh, African-American president there, too. So maybe it was a foreshadow of things to come, although I would have never known that back when I was 17 or 18 years old. A brief civic lessons, which I always try to do, which I tried to do when I was running for election. So many people aren't familiar with the court system, and, and particularly when it comes to election years. Um, in the even number of years in our state, your county, state, and federal offices are up. So, you know, whether it's a presidential election year or a gubernatorial election year and, and, and then the judges on the common pleas court, the, the courts of appeals here and the Supreme Court. Those elections are, you're going to have somebody on the ballot in those races every even number of years. 
And in the odd number of years, you have your municipal court races. So it would be your um, mayors and your municipal court judges and your city council people. And if, so if you've ever noticed, your ballots are a little bit skimpier in, in the odd number of years and even you have a lot. So in, the, in Ohio, all judges are elected. They are six-year terms. And um, there are occasionally times where the judge gets appointed when someone hasn't finished a term. They leave the office beforehand, like I did. I was on the Court of Appeals for the 8th District when I won a seat on the Supreme Court. And I had just been reelected in 2016. So that meant I, have, I left four years on my term. So when I went to the Supreme Court, the governor appointed someone to my seat. So that person had to then turn around and run at the next available election. You're used to seeing trial court judges, I'm sure, on television for the most part, or if you haven't been in the courtroom yourself. That's where you get the juries, and you get objections, and you get drama, and you get witnesses, and people pounding on the pavement. That's where the exciting stuff in law happens, at the trial court level. Not so much at the Court of Appeals and at the Supreme Court. Those are intellectual discussions that lawyers have with judges. You can represent yourself. You don't have to have a lawyer. But because of the, the, the uh, importance of arguing the law and being right in your arguments at the appellate court level, well, you don't want to have an attorney most of the time. Although I've seen some people represent themselves who have done quite a good job. So you get to appeal anything, anything as a matter of right to your local court of appeals. And in, in Lake County, where your school is, the 11th district is your, is your appellate district. In Cleveland, where I am, it's the 8th district. And then when I sit in Columbus, it's, it's, that's the 10th district. But Ohio is divided into 12 appellate districts. And you can appeal from any municipal court decision or common pleas court decision. Traffic ticket, speeding ticket, termination of parental rights, uh, medical malpractice suit, planning and zoning decision, um, uh, insurance claim from denial from a car accident, divorce, juvenile delinquency cases, all those cases, you think the trial court made a wrong decision, you have a right to appeal it to your court of appeals. You don't have such a right with the Supreme Court. We only take cases, with some exception, that is of great importance to the state or of great public interest to the state or of general importance, something that's got to apply to everybody. So we are not an error-correcting court like the intermediate appellate court is. And if there's a conflict, if Lake County courts of appeal, court of appeals judges make a decision and down in Dayton or Cincinnati, similar facts happen and the court made a decision that went the other way, then we have to take those two conflicts and resolve them at the Supreme Court. So that's in a nutshell what we do. Administratively, of course, we oversee the bench and the bar. Um, when there are disciplinary actions filed against any lawyer or any judge in the state, that comes before us. We regulate admissions, so we oversee the bar examination or lawyers who want to come practice in Ohio who are admitted to other states, or even people who practice law in our state who are not licensed to practice law in our state, so the unauthorized practice of law. So those are some of the administrative things that, that we oversee. Um, at the court. And that, that's, in a nutshell, your civic lessons on, a, on the Ohio judiciary. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to the next question, as you look at um, your distinguished career, you know, who has served as uh, role models for you and, and what role have they played? I, I think there's a global sense for me. Um, people I encountered all throughout my education, all throughout my career, um, played were role models, people who modeled for me how to behave, how to do things, how to practice law, and in turn, those who model behavior that I shouldn't model, how not to be. Uh, and those were people who, who supervised me and those people who were my peers. And, and I think if if you don't ever get involved with a formal mentorship program, which I, I advise in some instances you do, but you, you look at people who do the work that you want to do and, and you see how they treat people in supervisory roles and, and you think about how you've been treated also. And I can recall as being a young lawyer saying, you know, I'll never do that or I'll never be, you know, unprepared 
um, going into a courtroom when a judge asks questions. I'll always treat my clients with respect, and I'll always, you know, um, listen to what they have to say and listen to their concerns and try to explain things as much as possible. So really, my, where my role models were, were too numerous to name because some of those some of those people don't even know they were role models, good, good and bad ones for that matter. Thank you. Um, what are some challenges that you've encountered in your career and how have you addressed those challenges? For me, challenging, and, and some of it you know, might seem obvious, one being a, a female and a person of color who came into a profession at, at a time when um, women and people of color were, and still are to a large degree, a minority in, in the legal profession. Interestingly, when I started practicing as a young lawyer in my late 20s, I would often go against um, uh, opponents or lawyers on the other side um, who assumed, either based on my age or, be, or based on my gender or my ethnicity, that they had a leg up on me. And you could never get a leg up on preparation. And whether they assumed I wouldn't be prepared or because they were more experienced, um, that they could bully me. And that was always a mistake because then I was always better prepared and would then either go to trial on a case or have to have them come down significantly on their on their um, uh, settlement proposals in, in cases. I did civil defense litigation and um, would oftentimes get a settlement authority to, to, to settle a case to cut our losses for the city and save the city money and would often tender less money than I had settlement authority for and would bring it back to the coffers. And so um, that was always kind of interesting to me. And soon after, you know, you get a reputation and that doesn't instantly happen anymore. And that didn't happen with all lawyers. Some lawyers will, will assume that you are as prepared for a case as, as they are. But, but navigating them um, was, was really recognizing that there are some prejudgments that are going to precede me. Uh, there are going to be judgment calls made as I walk into the door uh, of a room, and then recognize myself that they have biases, people prejudge, and then I too have my own biases that I would have to to check moving forward because they skew how, they skew everything, your decision making um, and how you approach things, and, and so I think recognizing that has been a lifelong learning process for me. Thank you. Uh, what do you consider to be some leadership best practices? Definitely listening. Um, and, and for me, listening, um, it used to be in my generation, um, treat people the way you want to be treated, you know, the golden rule. Now I think the platinum rule for the generation below me is, you know, people treat people the way they want to be treated. And, um, and I try to become very aware of that. And I, and I think part of good leadership is making a decision that's good for the whole, even though it might not personally be good for you or good for a few individual people, particularly as, as an elected official. Um, I can't think of any elected office where your primary goal or motivation is to please a small group of people. You're supposed to be in that office for your public service is to be for your constituency, whether it's at the federal level, state level, or local level. But you have to do things that are best. And I don't know of a single public office where you don't take an oath to uphold some provision of the law, either like the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the Law of the State of Ohio, or if you're, you're the local ordinances and the charter for your city. And you take that oath, and if it has any meaning for you, then you do the job accordingly. And that might not always be the, the most popular decision. Um, oh, it's certainly not a decision that benefits a few group of individuals. And, and you stand by that and you have the courage to do that. That, to me, are, those are signs of uh, the best leadership practices. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to ask about communication skills. You mentioned listening. Um, but do you uh, feel that they're important? Well, what communications do you feel uh, communication skills are important to develop uh, and do you have suggestions for developing those skills? Um, one thing is to, um, I try to talk this way, 
as opposed to talking that way. Um, and what I mean by that is when I'm having a, an individual conversation or conversation with, with people, I can see, I want to know, one, what it is they need or want to hear, what their impressions are of, of what I'm saying, which has been interesting in the Zoom time because, of course, <laughs> You know, your panel, your 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 students can see me. I can't see them. I can't see if your eyes are rolling or if you're looking up at the ceiling or if somebody's falling asleep. Um, but you know, but when you're when you're one on one, certainly it's looking for it's talking it's talking this way as opposed to that way, and not not trying to press upon you um, everything I want you to know. I want to try to say what I think you need to hear or you want to hear or that you need to have an understanding about. Um, and, and, and it is asking for me, too, prying questions. Um, I think over the years that it, I, it's a continuing, continuous developing process for me. But it's asking questions that really manifest my um, desire to know what it is that would be helpful to you and, and why you know, why we're even having a conversation in a formal setting or an informal setting. Thank you. Um, what suggestions do you have for obtaining or maintaining a work-life balance? Ah, I have none. <laughs> no, I, I mean, you know, I mean, that's just absolutely do the best you can under the circumstances. I um I went back and got my, you know, my undergraduate degree is in music um, because with a name like Melody, what else would I study in undergraduate school, right? So I got a bachelor's of music degree at the Conservatory of Music at the University of Cincinnati because that is the only thing I wanted to study coming out of high school. I, I mean, I did make the connection between work and school or having a career or supporting myself in school. It's just what I wanted to study, the only thing I was interested in, in doing. And so, um, and didn't think about law school. But matter of fact, when I finished my undergraduate degree, I was like, stick a fork in me, I'm done. Um, but, but later, you know, went on to go to law school. And then I was a lawyer for 12 years before I did the doctoral program. So I got a PhD at the Mandel School at Case Western Reserve. And that's a degree that just kind of found me. And I'm so glad that I got it because that those studies help me to write that help me to to ask the right question when I'm on the bench and when I'm when I'm analyzing a case and when I'm writing a question. And so I think acquiring as much knowledge as you can in different areas. And again, it doesn't have to be degree seeking. It doesn't even have to be in a formal setting. I and mean, so much information is available, you know, on, on the internet now. And, and and granted, all of it is not valid, so you have to be careful about that. But, but being aware, too, of, of the give and take that you have in exchanges with people you talk to. And it's not proceeding when you don't know the answer to the, a question. I have externs and law students who work with me from law schools across the, the, the state, and I always say to them, there is no question that's a stupid question, and you're entitled to not know a lot of things. You're still students. Um, I don't know everything. None of us are all knowing. And so there are going to be things you don't know. But it's a travesty if there are some things you don't know and you continue not to know about, that you don't have the answers to. Because you have this access to me that, that no one else has access to other than my staff. And, you know, they're, they're just, you build upon that base and it becomes stronger and stronger. So there are times when, when I might hear a phrase that I, it, let me give you a prime example. I had to do videos recently. We had to do some public service videos, and the Chief Justice and I um, were at the court doing these, these videos, and I got an email from our public information staff that said, um, here's, a, here's a, a, a rough audit, rough draft of the video before we put, and the word was B-R-O-L-L, B-R-O-L-L, before we enter the, and for me, it was Brawl. I never knew what Brawl was. I don't know if any of you know what Brawl is. Well, it's not Brawl. It's B-Roll. I would do a B-R-O-L-L. -L. And B-Roll, of course, as some of you probably know who are in this industry, 
is the extra footage that they add. So I'll do my talk and they'll put videos of me sitting on the bench or something like that. Well, I never knew what brawl was or b-roll. And so before I had a conversation with my public information staff, I wasn't going to let them know I didn't know what it was. So, of course, I looked it up. And then it made perfect sense to me. And we could have a conversation about it. And so I'm like thinking now I can do a second career in TV producing or something with that information. Not so sure about that. But I love gaining that sort of information in industries with which I'm unfamiliar. And I think it just it broadens. And being on the bench, being on the court does that too. We get cases sometimes that the, the, the underlying substance of which we know absolutely nothing about. I know more about mineral rights now and gas mines and coal mines than I ever knew before I got to the court. But you have to become, your, your erudition has to increase exponentially because you need to have a fundamental understanding of a lot of things on a basic level in order to apply the law to it and judge it that way. So, you know, always acquire knowledge. Always, always be it with listening to audio books, reading, asking questions, having conversations. Always continue to acquire as much knowledge as possible. Well said. I would agree with you, obviously. <laughs> Being a professor, it's incredibly important. Constantly be learning. Um, we always try to impress upon our students uh, the importance of building up their network. Okay, and that value that that network will provide to you throughout your career and just your, your entire life. So what suggestions can you offer our students for building their networks? Um, I take every opportunity to do things that are not necessarily required of you, but for your class or, or for your jobs, but, but doing community things and going to events. For those of you who think you might want to be an elected official of some, in some capacity, or for those of you who, for whom it's not even on your radar now, you will go through life and you have to encounter elected officials or government office at some point. I mean, it permeates every aspect of our lives. Um, you know, people who collect our garbage um, have supervisors in their department and then there's a department head. So it might be the person who, who's the um, division head for city services. You know, there are times when you're going to see things that can be done better. And we have a tendency to think, particularly the younger we are, that people who are in certain positions or people who are older know better and they do it better because, heck, they got elected to the jobs, right? They got hired for the jobs. You will be, you will, you will find, if you haven't already found, that that's not always the case. And to the extent that you can do something better or offer some suggestions for something to be better, then you should do that. You should offer those suggestions every opportunity you get. Now, with the understanding that you may or may not be right, and there might be some facts um, uh, uh, about which you don't know, but, but you, you still offer up suggestions. I mean, think of the ideas. Think of the things that we now take for granted that had to be an idea in someone's mind. I, I read um, Steve Jobs' book um, when he thought, well, hey, wouldn't it be wonderful to have, be able to carry a thousand pocket when he was you know, creating the, the iPod? And, and for someone who grew up in the days of cassette tapes and eight track tapes and, and, and records, you know, that was, a, that would have been an incredible, you know, thought. Now we walk around and stream everything we want and have access to, to hundreds of thousands of things and documents. I mean, who would have thought that? Well, you can, and you can think about things now that my brain is just not even hardwired to think about. And so you, you make those connections and you understand those platforms and you take advantage, particularly as students, everything that's available to you free or at a discounted rate for students. I thought when I got to law school that I would naturally want to combine my music background and my law background and maybe go into entertainment law. So I became a student member of the American Bar Association because it was free or my local bar associations because all those I, was, I had access to all the seminars and all those materials free because I was a student. And so don't miss out on those opportunities, you know, whether you're a wealthy student or not, you know, you get, and you get the opportunity to, to rub shoulders with and talk to people who are working there in a particular profession. And so I think those are some of the best network, networking um, uh, opportunities I've had and, and just attending events and, 
and getting there a little bit earlier and and do and get, get gathering those materials. Thank you. Now, looking back on your career, if you were to do one thing differently, uh, what would it be? I'm often asked that question, and I have to tell you, and I'm honest about this, I cannot think of anything I would have done differently. And let me tell you why. Um, I don't, I don't walk on a cloud, and I don't wear golden shoes. Everything that has happened in my life didn't just come easily, come naturally. I was lucky, I was fortunate. I ran for the Court of Appeals three times before I was elected. So, you know, first two races, I was not successful. But, but I, what I realized midway through my career, and every job I applied for, I didn't get. And you see those things, I think you tend to want to see them as rejections. Don't view them as rejections. View them as redirections. For whatever reason, you were not supposed to get that particular job at that particular time. And I have to say, if a lot of those things that had happened for me happened, I wouldn't be where I am now. And and my job now is a pretty good gig, right? So I, I but you can't you can't go down you can't go down certain paths to get to where you're supposed to be. And we don't always know where we're supposed to be. And that's another point I might add too. Just say as, as the the dean of girls in high school approached me about running for office, something I would have never thought about doing and probably planted the seed to make me even think about running for office um, after college and after I you know, became an adult. Listen to what people say to you are some features where they think you would, could, where you, where they could, your, your talents would serve a particular business, entity, office well. Oftentimes people see it, what we can't see in ourselves. And, and those people who really need to listen to maybe directing your path. And sometimes, quite frankly, doors just need to slam shut in your face. Because I think it's the universe's way of telling you, no, you're not supposed to be here. You're not supposed to do this. Because you'll miss out on that opportunity. And that's where you're supposed to be in five years or ten years. But if you do this and it's too easy, you'll get comfortable. And you won't be in the right place. And you won't be in, in your, you know, most effective place. So, you know, those are, those are, are, are things that, you know, we're going to be disappointed sometimes. We're going to be ups and downs. We might not get the money we want or the title we want, but if, if you feel that everything that you do is important and it plays a role in the greater scheme, I mean, we have a, a staff of 250, 260 people at the Supreme Court, yet it is those seven justices that get all the attention and whose names are on everything, and we would be absolutely nothing without them, without our personal staff and without our overall staff. And I told, I had the pleasure of being the keynote speaker to the recent group of lawyers who passed the bar exam. And I told them, you know, you're going to have different titles in life. They might, they may not be partner in charge and they may not be chief counsel and they may not be attorney general or justice or judge or chief justice, but the work you will do will be equally as important. So always, always remember that. Thank you. I have one final question before we turn everything over to the, the folks who are with us today. Uh, what uh, advice would you give our future business graduates? So I, uh, let me make sure I'm off like that. So I think you say, what advice would I give future business students? And I said, I hope that this doesn't sound too public official like, but not to be motivated by money. Um, and, and I know that that's not always easy, particularly if, if you don't like me, you don't come from well. Um, I was raised by single mothers who worked for the post office and worked overtime so that I could have piano lessons you know, or so that she could pay my tuition. But I have always found that if I do a job to do it well and for the right reasons, the money follows. And I believe there are you know, books out there that talk about do what you love and the money will follow. But you've got to know how to manage it, too. So I think you've got to have respect for and appreciation of, of, of money, of wealth, and what it does, that you use it for a greater good, be it for your, your individual families or for your community or for just, just that it serves a, a great purpose. And, and to have a, a keen business sense, um, you know, just because 
um, you're able to produce wealth from a certain endeavor doesn't mean that 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 should be the primary goal. And when you say business, I think people automatically, automatically assume money. And I don't think that that's always the case with good business, good business judgment, good business acumen, good business decisions. Um, you know, doesn't always necessarily translate into well spoken like a non-business major, right? Gretchen, you're muted. You're, you're muted now. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> can you can tell if somebody's getting a little bit of WebEx fatigue over here, and that would be yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> Nope, again. Gretchen, we're not hearing you. So I'm going to go ahead and ask some questions. And just as soon you hear. Oh. Now I can hear you, Connie. Okay. Okay. I'm going to ask a question and then I'll I'll mute for real and we'll just kind of go back and forth because I'm not seeing a whole lot. So I just want to remind everyone to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, but Justice, you started us off with a um, a civics lesson and that seems to have struck a note because one of the questions um, deals with the cases um, that are heard in the Ohio Supreme Court. And the question is, can you give us a summary of some of the main cases, and also about how long does it does a case stay in the Supreme Court? Um, great question. You can hear me fine, I take it. Um, when a case gets accepted, you know, some cases we have to take on appeal. Death penalty cases in Ohio, someone is tried, convicted, of sentenced to death, that appeal immediately comes to us. It doesn't go to the intermediate level court of appeal. And those imagine, as you can well imagine, are some of the most heinous cases that there are. Um, also, we get certain public utility cases where we have to decide on on um, on, on billing and and decide on uh, um, issues dealing with how much utilities can pass on to consumers in in running the company. But but most of the cases that we get to decide, do we bring it in? The case. Prime example, there was one case where there was, uh, we heard it uh, last year, where there was an employer who did drug testing um, at the place of employment, not unfamiliar, correct, but the, the procedures by which they collected the urine sample, the employer changed. So they made the collection effort be that you had to be observed by somebody from the lab actually giving the urine sample, and that was new to the company. Usually, you go in, you take the cup, you bring your sample out. But this time, they were having employees who were randomly selected watched while they produced this urine sample. And so, a couple of employees could give it, a couple could not, and that led to Mr. Terminated if you if you can't produce the sample. Well, a few of those employees sued for violation of uh, uh, invasion of privacy. And the trial court threw it out. The Court of Appeals um, reversed that decision. And that decision came to us because how, whether we decided whether those employees could maintain a cause of action for invasion of privacy would affect all employers across the state of Ohio that, that had this. Likewise, we have so some of the civil cases deal with that. We likewise had a case where a young man was questioned by a social worker about, you know, alleged sexual contact with another child um, his age. And so this was a, a social worker investigator, but then she took the information and turned it over to the police, and the police brought the, the juvenile up on delinquency charges. So then the question became whether that was whether that information should be suppressed as being gotten from a state actor, because the state actor wasn't a police officer, did that violate that young man's constitutional right? Again, something that affects our whole society. We also had a case where someone was injured by someone who drove a motorized cart that plowed into another cart at a grocery store, and someone was hurt from that. We took that case in because 
you know all the stores that have motorized carts. Target, Giant Eagle, they do that as a service to people who are disabled to try to allow them some independence. Um, and how we decided that case would have a huge effect on insurances of stores across the state, whether stores would take motorized carts out of the use completely. So those are the kind of cases we take in that will have large, far-reaching impacts. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, we have a question. Um, uh, what do you consider to be your greatest accomplishment? Wow. I'd like to think it hasn't come up yet. Uh, we have another question. What do you like most about your work? The power of the pen. <clears throat> Being able to... Um, no, I'm going to let you on in this high-tech way we decide who writes a case. Because when we decide cases, then there has to be an authored opinion, right? So we hear a case, and we... And by the way, all of our cases are free and open to the public. When we open back up, you can come down to Columbus and hear them. But they're video stream now. So, for instance, we have cases, we hear cases next week on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. You can watch them live stream on the Ohio government channel or, and everything we do is archived. You can watch it later. So if there's a particular case in your community and you want to hear the oral arguments, you can listen to those. And, and so once we hear a case, then the justices conference. And we go by and we speak by seniority, so the Chief Justice gets the opportunity to speak. First, it's uninterrupted. Each person has his or her say uninterrupted. Then we, we discuss those cases back and forth. Well, why do you think that? Well, I think the law on this says that. Well, those facts don't support that. And we, we resist throwing cups at each other and throwing chairs. But, you know, sometimes it gets to be a heated discussion. Then we take a vote. And the majority rules, whether we affirm the decision of the lower court or whether we reverse that decision. It can be a 7-0 opinion. It can be 6-1, 5-2, or 4-3. If you're in the minority, if you're 6-1, or if you're in the 2 or the 3, you can write what's called a dissenting opinion, and you say why your colleagues were wrong, uh, why you feel your colleagues were, were wrong. And sometimes you agree with the outcome, but for different reasons. And then you write a concurring opinion. So the power of the pen is, is how, uh, is what I like most about the job. Because you can say um, why you think this law is terrible, why it should change, why you're, you think your colleagues might, must be out on an island and not dealing with the realities of the world. And you can write that. And that will be there long after I'm gone. So maybe for, so, and I have no doubt if, that some of you will become lawyers in this class. And hopefully you'll remember sometime down the road when you cite Justice Stewart in a majority opinion or something, she'll say, she, she said that this would live on long after her. And uh, so, so it is the writing. It is, it is the analysis that you put forth. And you have to be intellectually honest about it, too, because just as it might weigh sometime in the future and change a decision, it can also look back and say, wow, what was she thinking when she wrote that opinion? And it can haunt me for, you know, for the rest of life, too. But it is the power of the pen. And who gets the opportunity to write, real quickly, seven, we have seven marbles, the numbers on those marbles. And if all seven of us agree, and we, we take turns so that the work is evenly distributed, those numbers go into a bottle, it's shaken up, and it pours out, and whatever marble comes out with your number on it, gets to write the opinion. So it's a high-tech way we do this. <laughs> I was going to say that's very high tech. Um, so that brings a question to my mind. I teach business communication. I know we have a lot of business communication students with us today. And, of course, writing is a, is a skill that we're building. How did you come to build your writing skills? I think I built them the most from teaching legal writing, believe it or not. Um, I tried to – I did well with writing courses um, at – level and uh, but particularly at law school and law school writing is a bit different I've had students who are journalists um, who are excellent writers in that format sometimes flowery or sometimes um, but but as as legal writing it's a different type of writing I have four externs working with me now from three different law schools 
And I'm trying to transition them a little bit away from writing for law school exams and writing in practice, which is a bit different. They want to give me a paper that says, this is the issue of the case. This is how I, this is a short answer to how it should come. This is the statement of the facts, and this is the statement of the case. And I'm like, you know, I don't have time to read something in duplicate. So if you're going to tell me those facts later, don't give me a statement of the facts early on. And it's the way they need to write to pass the bar exam. Practitioners, for the most part, read those bar exam questions. So you need to write in a way that tells the reader that you're writing for an intelligent but uninformed reader. And you're telling them everything they need to know. When you write a bench memo for me, it should be as if I'm getting off a plane, haven't had time to read the documents, the briefs of the parties, and that the only thing I get to read before I take the bench will be your memo, your bench memorandum. So it needs to tell me everything I need to know, all important case law, and not a single solitary word more, because then you're wasting my time. So that's that's how I teach and that's how I write and that's how I, I try to do, but it's always a fine tuned process. I feel more comfortable now. I feel like I'm riding a bike doing it and it flows a whole lot easier. Um, but you know, it, it takes practice like anything else. Great. It's a skill set that you can build and learn. Right? Absolutely. Um, we have a question about what is your proudest accomplishment and what is the thing you regret the most? Yeah, I, I kind of think you know we touched on those. Um, I I hope I haven't. I hope I have yet to uh, uh, see or achieve my proudest accomplishment. Quite frankly, uh, and and what would I do differently? What would I change? Nothing. I, I, everything happens the way it's supposed to. Even though I don't see the efficacy of it sometimes immediately. Um, and, and so I don't. I think if I if I wish something had happened differently, then it would change the course of other things. And, and I don't know that I'm supposed to do that. I just hope that I can and learn as much as possible from things that I can. Um, if you know, my being on the court paves the way. Uh, it gives me the opportunity. Certainly, being a statewide elected official gives me the opportunity to, to meet people who I would otherwise not have the opportunity to meet. And that was kind of my campaign motto. When I crisscrossed the state and get advice, oh, don't go down to that county. You know, those people aren't going to be friendly to you. And, you know, I went through all that. I was running for the state Supreme Court, not Northeast Ohio Supreme Court, not Cleveland Supreme Court, not Cuyahoga County Supreme Court. And I believe, that, and, and I found that we really are more alike than we are unalike. Most people want good government, they want their taxpayers' dollars to work for them, and they want people to do their jobs, and they want them to treat it with respect. And so that's what I did on the campaign trail, and I would give everybody a little overview, like I did you, of what the court system is and why it's important to vote for judges. So that was my goal on the campaign trail, such that if I was not successful in winning the election, then I was successful in educating as many people across the state about the judicial offices. And when those polls closed at that night, we posted on my Facebook page, I already feel like I'm a winner. I've met incredible people across the state, and I was okay with the outcome, with the results. Great. Um, here's an interesting question. Is there a case that you wish you had not been involved in? No. <clears throat> um, there is not a case that I wish I had not been involved in. And let me tell you why. When I was on the Court of Appeals, I had a case where I was in the minority in the decision. Um, it was a 2-1 decision. All courts of appeals across the state sit in three-judge panels of our state appellate courts, regardless of how many judges are actually on the court. We all sit in three-judge panels. So I was a minority member on a case um, that really caused some friction between the two other judges who were on the case and me. Um, uh, really, really some hard feelings that came from that. But I had an obligation to the case to the job, and it dealt with a, a, a person who I felt was wrongfully convicted. And where this crime happened, where uh, someone was murdered, I would have to pass this building on the way to my church from where I lived. And for years, years, I passed this building. And the only thing I would do, it was a woman who was found dead, her 14-year-old daughter found her. I would pray for her children. I prayed for her, and I prayed that if this 
gentleman who was convicted of a crime, if it, and, he, and when he's convicted, he turns to the prosecutor and said, I know you're doing your job, but you convict him an innocent man. And I just thought, if indeed he is innocent, hopefully one day he will be exonerated. And I wrote a scathing dissent in that case. Flash forward probably about uh, eight to 10 years. I'm running for the Supreme Court. I moved out of Cincinnati for an Ohio Innocence Project breakfast. And who is at that breakfast celebrating the one year anniversary of his exoneration for that crime? And it is that man. And he has no idea of my connection to his earlier cases. So I went over to him and I shook his hand and I congratulated him on on his exoneration. I said, I'm just sorry it took so long for justice to, to for you to get justice in your case. And he just shook my hand in his hand and said, ma'am, God is good. And and so, you know, those are, those are times when, even though it was very difficult dealing with that case with my colleagues, um, I'm glad I was on it. Um, we have a question. In today's climate with the Black Lives Matter movement, how do you remain impartial when faced with the sensitive issues of racism? Recognizing that it is a factor in our lives, but it's not always the factor that's involved. And, you know, a lot of people think, too, judges get to make decisions based on what we think or our personal opinion. And because we're judges, they're judicial decisions. Well, that's not the case. We have to apply the law to a set of facts and come up with the answer based on the law. And I will admit to you, there's sometimes where I have to render a decision and hold my nose rendering the decision because I think the law is so bad in a particular area. Um, we have to do a lot of work and, and, and maybe that's where, where, where so many of you get involved. There's implicit biases in every aspect of our lives and we all have them. Every single solitary one of us has our own built-in unconscious or implicit biases. We can't help it. It's where we live, it's how we've been raised, it's what the culture of our society has been, it's, it's what our history is. And we have to recognize that. We have to recognize that everything we think about and decisions we make that are personal decisions come from a place of that. And so we need to reframe, I think, and I think any job that has individual discretion, like police officers on whether to arrest people or whether to use their weapons, I think trial court judges, when they sentence people to prison, where you have an individual who gets to make such an important call about somebody's life, there needs to be better protocols and procedures and guidelines in place. For instance, I think we need to do something that that puts in place, um, takes away some of the discretion of when a police officer encounters a citizen, because oftentimes those encounters are based on nothing, and the citizen ends up being killed or shot. But we also need to keep in mind how much harm do police officers have to put themselves in when effectuating an arrest. You know, a police officer shouldn't always have to fear any kind of bodily harm when they're doing their job, whether it's being elbowed in the eye and have a broken eye socket, whether it's getting, you know, wrestled to the ground. And so we need to put protocols in place that look at both citizen safety and police officer safety. And, and keep in mind, all instances of, of, of excessive force by police officers are not just white police officers and black citizens. I mean, there's sometimes black police officers and black citizens or black police officers and, and, and non-black citizens. So, you know, it, it permeates across, you know, the racial you know, divide. But so we need to adopt, address it, I think, in, in a more holistic manner about it. And you do, you do recognize that it exists. But again, I recognize that, you know, I have my own biases that exist. And you have to check against them as much as possible. Thank you. Um, I have a question here regarding ethical challenges. Um, the, what ethical challenges have you encountered throughout your career and how did you handle them? Hmm. Fortunately, I've never, um, encounters a huge one, like somebody offering me a huge bribe to decide a case a certain way. Um, I've never been had those encounters, and thank goodness. And I'm always an advocate for, you know, it should not only be against the law to try to bribe an elected official. It should also be against the law if that elected official doesn't 
report that bribe. I bet that would cut down on a lot of a lot of those things. Um, the only thing I can think of that's off the top of my head was um, when I first was running for for judge on the court of appeals. Um, some of the political operatives in my community um, wanted me to run for a different race. <clears throat> excuse me, um, because they wanted me to go up against, uh, you know, I'm a registered Democrat in, in my county, uh, because probably for the most part in Cuyahoga County, um, you climb an uphill battle if you don't run as a, as a, as a, as a Democrat. But um, the, the party operatives wanted me to run for a local race against a sitting Republican judge. And for a whole lot of reasons, I wouldn't do that. One, because it was a municipal court seat and it was a trial court seat, and I was only interested in the appellate court. Two, that judge, although a different party than I am, was registered for, I knew was a judge in my community. I had a great deal of respect for her, and I thought she was doing a good job as a judge. I wasn't going to run just because we were different political parties. That never, I, and I have never run for an office for a seat to take away a seat from someone else because that person was a different political party or a different race or different anything. All my career, I've only run for seats that were that were being vacated by someone who was retiring or left the seat. Now, our positions are open for anybody to run. If you're eligible to run and you want to run, you are certainly entitled to do so. But for me, it's never been... Um, I've never wanted to run to try to take away someone's I, I only believe in running for all this season. Okay. I think we have time for one final question, but this is kind of a big question. Um, being an African-American woman mm -hmm. who has clearly broken the glass ceiling, what types of challenges have you encountered throughout your career, and how did you handle them? Well, <clears throat> um, Sorry, I keep clearing my throat. I, I, it has not been as challenging for me as it has been for some of my peers. Um, and, and maybe it's just because it's my approach to, to things. For instance, there are people who would not have gone to places in Ohio campaigning that I went to. Some places, some counties that were absolutely largely 100% Republican people who didn't live around people who looked like me, but I always give people the benefit of the doubt because I do feel that we have more in common, that we are more alike than we are unalike. And so for me, I'm going to give you the opportunity to one, find out who I am, what my background is, and why I think I'd be better for the position I'm running for. If after you hear that, you still decide not to vote for me, or you don't want to support me or you don't like me for whatever reason, then I put that on you as opposed to my assuming that you wouldn't listen to what I had to say or listen to, to you know, my credentials. And so then, then you can decide for yourself because I believe, again, most people want good government. They want good elected officials. They don't want their tax dollars wasted. And if you feel I'm going to do that job well for you, then you're going to vote for me, you're going to support me, and you're going to tell other people to do so. And then you've overcome any barriers that, that being a female or being a person of color might have. And then you bring your perspectives to the room. And I think that each time you do that, you, you, you do more positive. Um, it's a more positive experience than it is a negative one, at least for me. I, did, I had very little negative experiences. Uh, I, I did have some people who are outright and blatant about it, but they were few and far between. So before I turn this back over to Gretchen, I just want to thank you very much, but I, I want you to know that the chat box and the Q&A are filled with comments of appreciation, oh, admiration, and there are many more questions we just don't have time to, to get to. So for everyone that joined us, I do want to apologize for that. I tried to get a good representation. And I will turn it back over to Gretchen. And, and let me say this then too. For those of you who did ask and have questions, you know where I am. I'm at the Ohio Supreme Court. You can contact me anytime. If you ever, when we open back up, if you're ever in Columbus and want to come sit in on a hearing and, and contact me at a time, let me know and just get me on a good day. And I don't have too much to do at court. I'll take you to lunch. Ooh. <laughs>